In this video, we're going to take a look at hyperkalemia and some of the management options for hyperkalemia. So we're basically going to focus on severe hyperkalemia or what's happening when our blood uh, potassium levels become exceptionally high. Really, we're going to be taking a look at some of those um, exceptional cases of hyperkalemia where blood potassium levels are getting into the high 6s, 7s, or 8s, and we're seeing um, really a dramatic change in our myocardial action potential as a result. So we know that hyperkalemia is going to be indicated by an increase in blood concentration of potassium. So we know that our blood concentration of potassium is going up. And we know that potassium is typically the normal intracellular ion uh, for our cells. And we're going to look specifically again at the myocardial cells. So this cell that I've drawn here, picture this as being a myocardial cell because it'll help us understand the impact on the myocardial action potential. So we know that the inside of the cell is predominantly negatively charged. So when we look at the uh, inside of the cell, it has a predominantly a negatively charged compared to the outside. There's a couple of things that are going to play a role in this. We know that inside the cell, we have negative proteins or large proteins that are negatively charged, which are really driving this negative current. And we know that outside the cell, we have a number of our positive ions, uh, primarily being sodium. So we have a high uh, concentration of sodium outside the cell, which is help creating our resting membrane potential. Um, so uh, we need to know also that potassium can flow freely across the membrane. So one of the pieces here is that potassium can actually uh, flow across the membrane based on a gradient, which creates resting membrane potential. Now, when someone is hyperkalemic, what we start to see, because the blood concentration is rising, we begin to see uh, a change in our gradient and potassium wants to flow into the cell. So in hyperkalemia, we start to see a large inward shift of potassium into the cell. So what we're starting to see is a large inward shift. We're getting an influx of potassium into the cell, or we start to see influx of potassium uh, into our cell, um, which is creating uh, the issues with hyperkalemia. So we know uh, as the blood uh, potassium uh, levels are rising, what we start to see is influx of potassium into the cell. And as a result, what starts to happen, happen is the resting membrane potential rises. So we start to see an increase in resting membrane potential. Now, the big problem of, with this is when resting membrane potential becomes significantly high. So this influx is uh, changing the resting membrane potential to making it more positive. And we're starting to see uh, an increase. The resting membrane potential is increasing. A couple things that we have to be aware of. One is that we know we have a threshold potential. So as we can see, essentially, uh, the move or we start to see in the myocardial action potential as we hit threshold we really start to open those sodium channels and that's where we get this really big spike towards our peak potential or we start to have depolarization now what happens in hyperkalemia is we start to move our resting membrane potential above this threshold potential so the blue line that i've drawn here is our threshold potential so as hyperkalemia becomes severe what begins to happen is our resting membrane potential starts to increase and it actually increases above our threshold potential. So what I want to draw in here is the resting membrane potential in hyperkalemia, which is now above the threshold. And the problem with it moving above the threshold is that we're going to start to see closure of sodium channels. So remember, what's happening at uh, the threshold is we have our pacemaker fires, stimulates the opening of sodium channels in myocardium, and as we start to see the increase in sodium channels, we hit a threshold, which is promoting a huge influx of sodium. Once we get to this point, those voltage gated sodium channels uh, close. So the more positive our resting membrane potential comes, or as we go over the threshold, our myocardial cells assume that uh, not as many sodium channels are needed. So what we start to see is closure of sodium channels. So what happens when we move our resting membrane potential above the threshold is we subsequently lead to a closure of sodium channels. And what you can think of now is that we have less sodium channels available to have an action potential. And if there's less sodium channels available to have an action potential, the movement of sodium into the myocardial cell is going to be slower. And that's exactly what we see with hyperkalemia, is we start to draw out our resting membrane potential because we have less sodium channels open to allow for um, sodium to rush in. So we have slower a slower phase zero, basically, 
because we have less sodium channels available, so the movement of sodium into the cell is slower, which is going to prolong our action potential. And that's when we see the kind of the consequences of uh, hyperkalemia. So what happens is I get this slow phase zero is I'm going to start to see widening of the QRS complex, which can lead to that sine wave rhythm that we see. As we have the slower phase zero, think about what this is. We're looking at prolongation of our action potential and prolongation of the absolute refractory periods, which is also going to slow our rhythm or slow our rate down. So again, two consequences of this. As we close those sodium channels, we start to slow the influx of sodium into the myocardial cell. So we get a, slow, a slower phase zero, which is going to prolong our action potential, and it's going to lead to a wider or widening QRS. If you think about the other uh, consequence of a slow uh, phase zero is that we have a longer refractory period, which means that we're going to have a slower rate. So we had a longer refractory period, which is going to also uh, usually lead to a slower rate or we get a reduction in rate. So this is where we see the wide slow rhythms that are typical in someone who is experiencing hyperkalemia. So what are the treatments for this? What, is, uh, what are we going to do to try and manage this? So when you look at acute treatment of hyperkalemia, there are a few options to give. One, one of the frontline treatments is calcium gluconate. So calcium gluconate uh, is often given frontline uh, to patients who are experiencing hyperkalemia because calcium gluconate is going to increase the threshold potential. So when you give calcium gluconate, you're actually looking to have a membrane, membrane stabilizing uh, effect. So the way it does that is through increasing the membrane potential. So calcium gluconate will increase the membrane potential. And the benefit of that, again, I think about what we've drawn here, is if I can increase this membrane potential, so I give calcium gluconate, and I increase the membrane potential uh, above the resting membrane potential or where we have the resting membrane potential in hyperkalemia, I now promote the opening of sodium channels. So when we give calcium gluconate, this blue line being our calcium gluconate, we increase the resting membrane potential and we actually promote opening of sodium channels that were closed um, when we were above the threshold. So this will help uh, stabilize the membrane or help stabilize the myocardial cell and will promote the opening of uh, sodium channels. So basically by giving calcium gluconate, what we're doing is we're preventing this piece. We're preventing the resting membrane potential from being above the threshold. So that's where we would target um, uh, the myocardial cell when we're looking at tritium, treating hyperkalemia. So one, calcium gluconate is going to increase the threshold potential and hopefully stabilize the myocardium and allow for a, a more normal um, action potential because we're going to promote opening of the sodium channels. One of the other things that you can see uh, being given uh, to patients who are hyperkalemic is insulin. So uh, insulin is often uh, supported for these patients. So insulin is given because insulin will help promote uh, the driving of sodium into the body cells. So remember here, we're looking at the myocardial cell. Well, insulin will promote uh, cell storage or systemic cell storage of potassium. So we'll see systemic uh, cell storage uh, of potassium. So insulin helps basically drive uh, potassium into the cells. Well, the benefit of that is if I can store potassium and basically the entirety of my body and reduce to total body potassium levels, the myocardium uh, won't see these effects. So again, I'm looking at the myocardial cell here where the influx of potassium is a bad thing. What I'm hoping to do by giving insulin is I'm going to systemically store potassium in all of those little cells, get the potassium out of the blood supply, so I don't see uh, this impact on the myocardium. So insulin is one of the uh, treatments that you're going to see given for hyperkalemia. One of the other treatments that you're going to see for hyperkalemia for a very similar mechanism is a beta-2 agonist, so something like salbutamol because salbutamol is going to promote storage uh, of potassium in the cells as well. So I'm going to move our myocardial cell out of the way for a second. So this is our myocardial cell that isn't having the impact that we see here. If we take a look at our systemic cells. So if this is our uh, picture, these are, this is being the body cells. One of the ways which I can reduce total body potassium is by giving things like insulin and uh, giving things like uh, a beta-2 agonist. So insulin will 
uh, promote the uh, movement of potassium into the cells. So as we give insulin, that's going to promote influx of potassium or cell storage or total uh, cell storage of potassium. So our body is going to, in general, be storing potassium into the cells. The other impact is that you can give a beta-2 agonist, so something like um, something like uh, salbutamol can have this effect as well. So when I give salbutamol to this patient or a beta-2 agonist, that's also going to promote uh, cell storage of potassium, which can help reduce potassium in the blood supply and reduce this impact on the myocardial cell specifically. So beta-2 agonists can have that effect as well. And when you look at uh, later line treatments, a couple of things can be given. So diuretics so can actually pee the potassium out. Uh, dialysis may be provided to the patient to get the potassium into the blood supply that way. And also you might see uh, sodium bicarbonate given to the patient. So we can give sodium bicarbonate. Sodium bicarbonate has a couple of different benefits for these patients. So one is sodium bicarbonate is going to promote a more alkalotic um, extracellular environment. So if we look at the blood supply, one of the things that sodium bicarbonate is going to promote is a reduction or a decrease in hydrogen ion concentration in the blood. So sodium bicarbonate will decrease hydrogen ion concentration in the blood. One of the benefits uh, to that is that if hydrogen ion concentration decreases in the blood, one of the things that the cell will do is actually pull hydrogen ions out of the cell and into the blood. And it, by doing so, it actually exchanges those hydrogen ions for potassium. So sodium bicarb, one of the things it will do is help promote the storage of potassium by decreasing blood concentration of hydrogen ions, which will promote exchange of hydrogen for potassium. So uh, again, sodium bicarb is actually going to uh, promote the essentially the influx of, um, of potassium into the cell by decreasing blood concentration or decreasing hydrogen ion concentration in the blood. The other benefit of sodium bicarb is when I provide more sodium to these patients. Again, remember, we have closure of sodium channels, which is essentially leading to this slower phase zero. When you give sodium bicarb and increase sodium concentrations, you have more sodium to try and force through those closed cells, which can help lead to a faster response or faster phase zero response as well. So anytime I have a prolongation of phase zero, if I basically just give an intense amount or give more sodium to push that sodium through those uh, closed cells, maybe there's not as many sodium channels available, but I can push the sodium through those channels a little bit faster um, and lead to a reversal or some reversal of effect uh, or a faster phase zero. So a couple of different treatments for uh, the patient experiencing hyperkalemia. Uh, calcium gluconate 1 is going to increase the threshold and stabilize the membrane. That's the primary treatment or the life-saving treatment for these patients. Then we're actually going to target uh, storing the uh, potassium in the cells of the entire body to try and get uh, some of them away from the myocardium hill. And one of the ways you'll do that is through the use of insulin, which will actually promote storage of potassium, beta-2 agonists, which are going to promote storage of uh, insulin, and then the use of sodium bicarbonate, which is actually just creating uh, essentially an alkalotic environment to promote efflux of potassium and the in, or efflux of hydrogen ions and the influx of potassium. The other benefit is that we're going to see uh, basically forced, uh, forcage of more sodium uh, through the closed cells, which can help stabilize the membrane as well. Now, that being said, calcium gluconate, insulin, and salbutamol uh, tend to have less negative impacts on the patient or, uh, or have less side effects uh, that we don't want in the patient who's experiencing hyperkalemia. The challenge with sodium bicarbonate is it can lead to uh, things like hypercarbia, um, and we can see uh, mixed acid base imbalances when bicarbonate is given. So again, when we're looking at frontline treatments or the preferred treatments in these patients, calcium glucon gl gluconate first, insulin plus uh, dextrose if available, and then salbutamol third in order to have those kind of stabilizing impacts on the patient.